Good afternoon and welcome to today's program titled Walking the Tightrope of Pain Management and Addiction Using the Addiction-Free Pain Management System. I'm Gary Enos, editor of Addiction Professional Magazine. Today's program is a Foundations Recovery Network webinar sponsored by ALEAR. Thank you to our sponsor and to you and our audience for giving us your time and attention. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping details. Each window on your screen can be moved by clicking and dragging or enlarged and minimized by clicking the icons in the top right corner of each window. Please use the Q&A area to the right of the slides to submit a question at any time. If you cannot see this area, simply click the red Q&A button. To download a copy of today's slides, please click the link in the resources area in the bottom left of your screen. If you have any technical issues during today's program, please click the yellow Help button to troubleshoot the issue. I have a special note to present about CE credit. Our CE process has changed slightly. To receive credit for today's program, you must click the green Evaluation Form widget at the conclusion of the program and complete the evaluation form. If you are watching today's program in a group, please download the group submission guide and evaluation form located in today's resources list and follow the instructions. You can also tweet during today's presentation via the Twitter widget by clicking on the blue Twitter icon at the bottom of your screen. Simply click the Post and Authorize buttons to log into your Twitter account and begin sharing at the hashtag AP Pain Management. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ellen Grinstead, CEC, CAPMS, at Addiction Free Pain Management. Ellen Grinstead has worked for over 20 years in corporate environments and for the last 13 years has run a consulting, training, and coaching business specializing in chronic pain management and coexisting psychological disorders, including addiction, with her husband, Stephen. She has a certification from UC Santa Cruz in alcohol and drug studies, as well as human services counseling. She is a lifelong learner with over 35 years in recovery. Ellen is also a certified empowerment coach through the Institute for Professional Empowerment Coaching with an advanced coaching credential through the Academy for Coaching Excellence. Thank you, Ellen, for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, the audience is yours. Thank you, Gary. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today and uh, being able to present this information to you. So most people know someone who's had some kind of chronic pain condition. Whatever I go to an event, uh, talk to people at networking meetings or at trainings, they either have a loved one that's in some kind of a, a pain, suffering with a chronic pain condition, or they know someone who knows someone. Um, and there are more and more people having problems with their pain medication as well. And then it's even more challenging for people in recovery, many who have relapsed over a mismanaged chronic pain condition. So today's presentation is designed to arm you with some information and new tools to help you address this problem more effectively. So as we move forward, I want you to keep in mind three important questions. The first, are we managing pain but fueling addiction? What happens when people are over-medicated or are prescribed a medication that becomes a problem for them? Well, Jason, who's a formal, former patient of ours, is a perfect example of what happens when addiction issues aren't factored into a pain management plan. Jason or originally came into therapy to work with Steve for premarital therapy with uh, his fiance. And after they finished that work together, they, um, Steve, uh, I'm sorry, um, Jason had a, an accident about six months later. Uh, he was skiing, hurt himself pretty badly. And at that point, he had been in recovery from alcohol and methamphetamine addiction for over 12 years. He, uh, at that time, he was using only over-the-counter medication and physical therapy, but his pain worsened and his doctor prescribed Vicodin. At first, he was only taking three to four tablets a day. 
Uh, after a few months, though, he was up to 15 to 18 per day. And this was from three different prescribers. So for Jason, his addiction was reignited and then fueled by the Vicodin. He got back into seeing Steve and then was uh, switched over to some more recovery-friendly medications, stopped taking the Vicodin, and was doing much better. And then we'll talk a little bit later about more friendly uh, medications for people in recovery. Question two, and this is directed towards addiction treatment professionals. Are we treating the addiction but sabotaging the pain management? So what happens when people who become addicted to their pain medication have to enter an addiction treatment program? So addiction treatment programs really only focus on about one-third of the problem, the addiction problem. And a patient's pre-existing pain condition doesn't often get addressed. So Sharon was a client who had a pain management plan that was sabotaged by a well-meaning treatment program. She was uh, about 43 years old, three, uh, two adult children, and had developed premenopausal periodic migraines. She came from a religious upbringing, pretty normal childhood. She had never used alcohol or any drugs up until that point, not even nicotine. And her doctor gave her opiates for the pain. And as I'm sure many of you know, opiates can lead to rebound migraines. At first, Sharon, she was only taking like two to three, she only had two to three migraine episodes a month, but nine months later, she was having three to four per week. Originally, she was taking five to ten Vicodin per month, but that increased to four to six 80 milligram Oxycontins per day, in addition to five to six Vicodins a day for breakthrough pain. Again, I'm sure you know this, but that's an extremely level, high, high level of opiates. And unfortunately, her doctor blamed her. He actually said to her she got herself addicted and refused to treat her unless she got into an addiction program. Her family was very concerned, and they uh, supported the doctor in that decision. Now, in the treatment program, they did not have separate tracks for people who had pain conditions and people who were there for uh, alcohol or other drug addictions. And she was made to stand up in front of the group and admit that she was um, an addict. And she couldn't even say that she was a pills addict. And this was pretty shaming for her. And, and she felt very blamed, especially for someone with her kind of a background. And when she had migraines and when she was having some pain flare-ups, they labeled her as drug-seeking. After she left the treatment program, uh, Sharon attempted suicide. Uh, she was hospitalized, and then she was uh, referred to Dr. Grinstead. The next question also pertains to Sharon. Is it addiction or pseudo-addiction? Now, Sharon was misdiagnosed. She was not addicted. She had pseudo-addiction. And we'll go over the description a little bit later, but simply, pseudo-addiction is mistreated or undertreated chronic pain. Sharon should never have been given opiates for her migraines in the first place. As mentioned on the previous slide, they can re lead to rebound or transfer migraines. Now, there's a, a web, uh, on the Medscape website, they had an article that talked about the problem with opiates and migraine. So it's called Barbiturates and Opiates Increased Risk for Chronic Migraine. And there's a, a lot of information out there about the problem with, with uh, using opiates for this particular condition. So in other words, it was a heavy opiate use that were causing the increase in Sharon's migraines. That went from two to three a month to three to four per week. When she got into working with Steve, he was able to get her on an appropriate migraine medication plan that used specific migraine medication. Plus, they did uh, CBT therapy and uh, were addressing her psychological pain conditions. Now, this work drastically improved the quality of her life. Um, her migraines lessened, and then also uh, they came down in frequency and intensity. 
the next few slides are going to give you some background information about the seriousness of opiate abuse and chronic pain in the United States. More and more people are living with chronic pain, which has led to an increase in medication abuse and addiction problems. Not only that, more and more people are using it non-medically. This was true in 2004, and it's only gotten worse. In addition, there's research that shows prescription medications are one of the fastest growing drugs of abuse, especially for 15 to 25 year olds. I'm sure you have all heard about the farm parties where kids will get the prescriptions from their parents or their grandparents' uh, medicine cabinet, you know, throw them all in a bowl, and then everybody you know, takes their pick. But the most alarming statistic on this slide is that over 90% of patients who visit their doctors with pain complaints are given an opiate prescription at some point. That was true in 2006, and it remains the case today as well. So we know that chronic pain costs a lot of money to treat. As a matter of fact, back in 2001, the Institute of Medicine declared chronic pain not just a problem, but a national epidemic. They estimated that almost $635 billion a year is spent to treat chronic pain. Now that's almost $2,000 for every person living in the United States. They also determined that about 116 million people are suffering with a pain condition. That's more than heart disease, diabetes, and even cancer combined. Using a conservative 10% estimate, over 11 million people will develop a substance use disorder. This includes medication abuse, pseudo addiction, and addiction. And we'll talk more about the differences between those later. When talking about prescription drugs and pain management, it's important to look at some of the most common drugs of the use that people are using. Dr. Grinstead's philosophy is that there's not any such thing as a bad medication. He believes that medications can either have a positive effect or a negative effect. So it depends on the individual. What's the medication? What is it used for? How are they using it? Um, for instance, one side effect for individuals in recovery is a potential for relapse. But not everyone in recovery who uses t medications or pain medications is going to relapse. Just as not everyone who is taking pain medications is going to become addicted to them. So here's a poll question. I want to get I want to get an idea of what you what you all think of this. What are the following drugs? Uh, and these are some some of them that people use for pain management, do medical professionals forget to screen or ask about? Go ahead and let me know what you think of that. Let's see, how is that coming? Yes, so there's 63 point 3% of you see, believe that it's all of the above, and indeed it is. Oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh. All right. I'm way ahead of myself here. Sorry about that. So people, some people are surprised to see that alcohol, marijuana, and methamphetamine are on this list. But people do use it. Patients will um, add alcohol and marijuana, even methamphetamine, if their pain condition is not being addressed appropriately. And many pain management providers don't screen for these drugs either, and they really should. So for pre prescriptions for hydrocodone, for instance, Vicodin and Loratab, have increased almost 800% in the past 10 to 12 years. This year, the FDA advisory panel is suggesting raising hydrocodone from a Schedule 3 to a Schedule 2 due to its abuse and addiction potential. Now, although OxyContin gets a lot of press, many of the other drugs on this page actually have a higher rate of abuse and more serious side effects. Now, Demerol and Dilatin, their favorites, 
used by addicts who are med-seeking or doctor shopping. And you remember Paladone. It was pulled in 2000 as too dangerous and has now been replaced with Exalgo. We had a, a call last, last year from a family member who was very concerned about his mother who was on this particular, this particular drug and was having a lot of problems with it and wanted to see how they could get her off of it. Many of you may also be seeing problems with Opana, which is even stronger than OxyContin. And methadone is becoming more prevalent in pain management. And there are a lot of problems with it as well. Many prescribers don't know how to do proper titration or uh, understand the side effects when combined with other medications like <coughs> I'm sorry, benzodiazepines. Now, the new generation of sleep medications are a particular pet peeve in our office. Uh, many people with chronic pain have sleeping disorders, and, and well-meaning um, treatment professionals and physicians are prescribing these on a daily basis, but they're really not meant for long-term use. And people can and do develop abuse and addiction to sleep medications. There's also a couple of supposed non-addictive medications that people still don't see as a problem. They can get in trouble with Ultram or Tramadol. Um, it hits the same receptor sites in the brain as morphine and is contraindicated for anyone who has an opiate addiction history. Soma also falls into that category. These are problems for people in recovery, actually from any addictive disorder. The benzodiazepines like Valium, Xanax, Ativan are also very addictive and dangerous, especially when people try to stop suddenly. And finally, over-the-counter medications are often abused, especially when they're not taken directed and have major side effects like Tylenol and acetaminophen, which can cause major liver damage in high doses. Other over-the-counter medications don't mix with prescriptions. And uh, it's really important to encourage patients to let their doctors know that all the medications they take, including alcohol and other drugs, they really need to be honest about that. And many people in recovery don't pay enough attention to what's in the over-the-counter medications, especially those that have ephedra or alcohol in them, because they can lead to a relapse. Here's another poll question for you. I wanted to see what you think about what, which of these are common treatment provider biases. This is a, a treatment obstacle that can get in the way of having a good treatment outcome. Do any of these sound familiar to you? Have you heard yourself saying them? It's all in their head. They're malingering. They're trying to con me. Drug seeking, med seeking. They need to learn to live with it. Let's see what people think. Yes, all of the above. So judgmental health care providers can be part of the problem. They can minimize the seriousness of someone's pain. They can and have told them it's all in their head, or they did it to themselves, or they're med-seeking and drug-seeking. So the biggest obstacle to these po positive treatment outcomes is when healthcare providers also fail to recognize and treat coexisting disorders. And we're going to cover some of those later on. And family system problems can also sabotage treatment. There's an extreme level of codependency and enabling that goes on in the family, even more so than addiction. Families often try to do too much, or they feel burdened, and they become angry with their, their loved one having to do too much. The more treatment obstacles um, is that uh, patients can become their own worst enemy. They can easily sabotage their pain management and even worsen their coexisting disorder, especially addiction. Um, these are some of the most common ways that they, they hurt themselves. Um, they'll start complying and doing whatever it is that the doctor wants just to keep the medication coming. Um, they also start to adopt this helpless, hopeless 
state of mind that there's nothing that can be done with them for them there's nothing that they can do and they become very passive another big obstacle is not resolving their grief and loss issues over a prior level of functioning feeling ashamed and guilty about having pain condition in the first place not being able to help in in work uh, this is a big problem with uh, his, our Hispanic clients. They uh, have a lot of guilt about not being able to support their family. And then co depression. And then there's some other co coexisting disorders that we'll talk about later as well. And then there's treatment and resistance um, and some denial. And this is not just about the medication, but it's their resistance to using anything else because they're so used to looking for just the right pill or the treatment procedure that they don't often see things beyond that that could be helpful for them. And then there's the power struggles with treatment providers, and no one wins with those. Another poll question for you is, what do you think are the two top co-occurring disorders with people with chronic pain and addiction? Eating disorders, trauma, depression, anxiety, sleep? Cognitive impairment, what do you think? Oops, let's see. Trauma, depression, anxiety. Well, in Steve's clinical experience, he believes that sleep and depression are the two most common conditions that people develop when living with chronic pain. However, a lot of people also develop cognitive impairment, not just from the medication, but from living with a debilitating chronic pain 24-7. Just think about the worst pain you ever felt. You had an accident, you broke a leg, tooth pain. Then imagine if you had to live with that day in and day out. It's, it's pretty tough. Many patients suffer from anxiety as well. Also, unresolved trauma and PTSD history uh, often leads to a failure in addiction recovery and effective pain management outcomes. In, in every patient that, that uh, we have had in our office who has had an addiction, they have had some kind of unresolved trauma that really needs to get taken care of and looked at. A number of patients also have eating disorders. Now, the remainder of the presentation will show you how the APM system deals with coexisting conditions using a collaborative, multidisciplinary team approach. It takes a team, everybody working together. So most of the chronic pain research that Dr. Grins has reviewed over the past two decades has been very clear about treatment outcomes. The best prognosis occurs when patients are proactive in their own treatment process. And one way to do this is for patients to learn as much as they can about their own pain condition. You know, what coexisting disorders are causing a problem for them, and then what constitute effective pain management. It's not just taking a, a pill or the right kind of medication. So in order to have really effective pain management and for people to gain suffering, uh, gain freedom from their suffering, um, it's really vital that patients become active participants and not remain passive. I mean, they have to be the key player, the captain of the team, and, and um, APM helps them develop their team and bring the people together that are going, going to help them the most. Uh, we can't be their guide, we can't be their um, pack horse. We're either a, a guide or a coach. We're not going to carry the load for them. And it's important to use a collaborative, strength-based approach. Um, confronting people uh, about their addiction is not helpful for them. And also, the patient has to be involved in creating their treatment plan, because if they're not involved, if they're not in agreement with it, they're not going to follow through. And then relapse and recovery, re relapse and, I'm sorry, recovery and relapse prevention plans um, have to be developed for both the pain and the coexisting disorder, not just the addiction.
In 2004, there were three different associations, the American Academy of Pain Medicine, the American Pain Society, and the American Society of Addiction Medicine. They came together and collaborated on a project to define four of the most misunderstood terms in pain management, tolerance, physical dependence, addiction, and pseudo-addiction. On the next four slides, we're going to look at what those clinical definitions are, but I'm not going to read them. Um, what, what's important to do is to rewrite the language so that patients can more easily understand it and apply it to themselves, because we want them to be able to, to look at this information and be able to see, oh, that, you know, see themselves in it. So we would, we would tell a patient regarding tolerance, you know, when you first use your medication, it only took one or two pills to get relief, and now it takes four or five. A lot of people confuse physical dependence with addiction. No, simply it's, it's your brain and body gets used to taking your medication and then starts to adapt to it as, as if it's your normal state. And when you stop taking it, you get sick. So this is very similar to a diabetic who takes insulin daily. If they stop suddenly, they will get sick. And then addiction. This is the most concise and complete definition that we've come across. And spiritual is added as we believe that addiction does affect the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. The bottom line is that addiction is a medical condition and not a moral weakness. Now, the thing to remember about pseudo-addiction is that it does look a lot like addiction, but it is actually caused by an undertreated or mistreated chronic pain condition. So it's important to remember that the treatment plan, though, for pseudo-addiction and addiction is identical. Now, the major danger of not addressing pseudo-addiction early enough is that it can turn into a full-blown addiction. I mean, sometimes it happens slowly, but sometimes it, it can happen very quickly. And this is what we would share with the patient. That pseudo-addiction looks a lot like addiction. Uh, you may appear to be drug-seeking or need early, f early f refills. Um, but the behavior is caused by an undertreatment or mistreatment of your chronic pain condition. And then the behaviors will disappear when the pain is adequately managed. Now, it's not always about increasing the medication dosages. Uh, this may mean switching to a medication, a new medication, or finding other interventions that are going to work better for you. Um, besides just medication, there are things that you can do. So how do you define relapse? I'm going to see what people think about this one. Do you think that a good definition of, re of relapse is when a person returns to the use of problematic medications, alcohol, or other drugs? What do you think? This, yes, a lot of you agreed that this is false. But this is the most common definition that people in recovery use. In, in fact, um, this is a dangerous, uh, a dangerous definition as well, because it's the very last stage in a relapse process. It's a, it's a not an event, it actually is a process. And we need to stop shaming and blaming people for their relapse. Um, there are other conditions where people relapse and they have even higher rates of addiction, diabetes, asthma, hypertension. So what needs to happen? You have to be in recovery in order to relapse. That's what we need to take a look at. I mean, too many people are diagnosed as chronic relapsers when they've never met the, the criteria for being in recovery in the first place. So these are the things that we look at to determine whether people are in recovery or not. Our patients need to have an objective, accurate understanding uh, of their pain disorder and their addiction. And they need to get that it's a neurobiological disease. They need to be able to apply it to themselves. 
It's not just head knowledge or about someone else or those addicts. No, this is about me. They need to accept the painful feelings that come along with uh, admitting that they're an addict. The most um, challenging ones for people are shame, guilt, and fear. Uh, they need to accept they've, that they've become addicted to their pain medication. Also important is having hope and belief that recovery is not only possible, but it's preferable. They need to come to that place where they really do want recovery. They have to be in that place. Also, they have to be doing the biopsychosocial spiritual recovery footwork that, that's needed to um, get better. Also, we look for people having an appropriate medication management track record at, of at least 90 to 120 days. They, they need to be taking their medication as prescribed for that period of time. So the research is really clear. Uh, the American Society of Addiction Medicine in 2011 found that there are three distinct paths from remission to relapse. The first, most obvious, is that somebody takes some kind of psychoactive drug. The second, the, they're triggered by something or someone. The needle, smell of, an al of alcohol, trip to the pharmacy, something in their environment or they have um, high levels of stress, and that ignites their fight, fright, freeze response. So here's the relapse cycle that I talked about earlier. This demonstrates how someone can go from stable recovery to dysfunction and relapse. The relapse cycle starts when someone meets the criteria for recovery that we just talked about, and they're making that commitment to recover. And the first stage of any relapse is going to start with some level of denial. Now, this has nothing to do with the person taking pain medication, alcohol, or other drugs. That's not going to happen until later on in this cycle. What usually happens, though, is that the person stops doing what helped them recover in the first place. We like to tell people that recovery is a process like walking up and down escalator. If you stop, you go down. So when a person stops growing, it's, this is going to lead the way for old, rational, self-defeating thinking patterns to return. And then this thinking leads to poor decision making. And then that poor decision making leads to behaviors with negative consequences. Now these negative consequences will ele elevate stress levels and then creates more new problems in a person's life. Now the way they deal with these new problems is with old impulsive and compulsive behaviors when they're at this point in the cycle. And again, nothing to do with taking any kind of a substance, but they're going back to behaviors that they used to do in their past, lying, cheating, overspending, stealing, procrastination. So now, they have either shame or guilt or feeling pride and arrogance. So when they, for instance, walk into a room of recovery people and think, I'm better than they are or I'm not good enough, um, they start to practice some strategic isolation. And as everyone knows, when, and this isolation creates a vacuum, so whenever there's a vacuum, it needs to get filled with something and people are going to do it, fill it with uh, their old friends, old places, and things that they used to do before they got well. Now at this point, they also lose this, start to lose contact with healthy people and healthy problem solving. They're hanging out with people who are as unhealthy as they are and dysfunctional in their thinking, and they start to experience even worse problems. In addition, now they're going to, they're, they're having pain flare-ups, and other problems in their life continue to increase. <clears throat> and they're thinking, hmm, well, if I can only take one of my old pills, well, this would be easier to manage, I mean, at least for a little while. I mean, I can handle it this time. But no, <clears throat> I'm in recovery. I might get monitored. 
what happens though, this, this state of mind leaves them really uh, at a loss and ill-prepared when they start to set themselves up in high-risk situations. And that situation is anything that turns on their old problem-solving behavior. Um, and this is where they would use inappropriate medication to manage their painful reality. And if people don't have a good relapse intervention plan in place, they, uh, they don't realize that the cycle can be stopped at this point <clears throat> with minimal consequences. They believe they've blown it and they've, they uh, have a difficult time coming back from a relapse. They need support and education in order to save their recovery. Or they will continue down that road of addiction and um, really hurt themselves. There are these, um, this list shows you some of the most common reciprocal relapse issues that people with pain problems are faced with. Um, we believe that people in their first year of recovery really should avoid all elective surgical or dental procedures. And we had a, a woman in our in our clinic, in our practice, who who uh, about six months uh, working with uh, Dr. Grinstead was absolutely adamantly convinced that she needed to have a facelift. And um, really developed some uh, problems with her pain medication after going through that. And it took, her, it took her quite a while to come back from that. Now on the other side um, of the coin is when people in recovery are faced with a pain injury, they're mistakenly believing that they shouldn't take anything, no matter what, which is promoted in 12-step in uh, recovery in AA. Don't take anything, no matter what. But it's unconscionable to think that or to believe that people in recovery cannot, don't have an outlet to manage their pain, that, that they have to suffer with it. Um, we don't believe that. We believe that people can learn how to manage their medication appropriately and deal with pain. But what happens for people is when they're doing this is they, they put their, themselves at risk for a relapse because the pain eventually comes too much for them to bear. And they might go back to their drug of choice or use alcohol or something else that's going to um, not be helpful for them. So, you know, other uh, relapse issues are having painful injuries uh, or other medical conditions or, again, a mismanaged chronic pain condition. So historically, Pain disorders and addictive disorders have been treated separately. Uh, when people have chronic pain and addiction problem, there's a synergistic reaction that occurs. One plus one doesn't equal two anymore. It, it really equals three or more uh, because there's an amplification of the symptoms. Uh, pain clinics um, only deal with one third of the problem, the pain, and addiction treatment programs only deal with one third of the problem, they're uh, the addiction. But what happens when both of these come together? There's a whole new set of symptoms. And as uh, we mentioned earlier in Sharon's story, and when she went to an um, addiction treatment program, they didn't address her pain management needs. And when, uh, ha when people go to a pain clinic who are having addiction-related problems with their, with their prescription medications, the pain clinics don't know how to address that, and they don't have the staff, uh, they don't have the infrastructure, and many people are discharged from the pain clinic because they're addicts. And again, there's those treatment biases that some, some um, clinics believe people are doing it to themselves. So the remainder of the presentation is going to show you how the addiction prepay management system deals with coexisting conditions. So if you want to learn more, uh, you can reference uh, Steve's book, Managing Pain and Coexisting Disorders. This explains how uh, addiction prepay management is a synergistic system and how it addresses the chronic pain and the addictive disorder at the same time.
Now, the APM system has uh, three types of components that will treat these synergistic sy symptoms from the pain and the addictive disorder. The first is the eight core clinical processes. Now, these are um, the exercises that form the foundation of the addiction-free pain management workbook using cognitive behavioral therapy. Second is finding and using appropriate and effective medical interventions. And then third is using holistic and non-pharmacological processes. Um, this supports patients to use a more proactive approach so they're not solely relying on medication. And then we're going to look at how um, more fully at these three components in the next slide. The first um, wanted to mention this other book, which is the uh, recovery guide, the Addiction Free Pain Management Recovery Guide, that was written to help cut down on the number of sessions needed to work with patients because they needed some additional education on pain and also on um, their addiction. So the first four chapters are concentrated on that. And then uh, chapters five through nine take people through two of a previous client, Dean and Jean, and how they completed each exercise in the workbook. So when, when clients read this book, they, they really have more of a sense of hope that I'm not alone, they can identify, and it also shows them how they can um, learn how to manage their pain more appropriately and they're not at, uh, they're not at the effect of it. And, and they can really have a lot more uh, control than they thought otherwise. Now, in this, this graphic, we're looking at the core clinical processes. Uh, the eight exercises in the Addiction-Free Pain Management Workbook are divided into four categories, and they build upon each other. So ABM starts with gathering information about the effects that chronic pain has had on a patient. Um, you also want to look at what the effects the medication has had on them. I mean, when they've taken the particular medications that they have, um, did they actually get what they wanted? Um, so when patients are looking at making new decisions around, around their medication, they often hit a wall. And then at this point, they need some denial management work. And when they address their denial around maybe something else besides their medication is going to help them or a different kind of medication, um, then they're ready to sign an appropriate medication management agreement and develop an insurance policy or an intervention plan. And this invites other people in their life to be a part of that as well. There's no more secrets. They've got their doctor, they've got their team, their family members, their, their sponsor, other recovery people. Then they learn how to identify high-risk situations that could put their recovery at risk. In the next exercise, um, they map out a high-risk situation identifying the steps that led to their relapse. Then they analyze those steps using cognitive behavioral therapy and apply what they learned to the present. And then in that last exercise, they develop a plan of action using what they learned, and then they apply it to a future high-risk situation so that they can prevent a relapse. Now here are some of the recovery medications that I talked about earlier. These slides were developed in collaboration with Dr. Jerry Calloway and his wife Sheila Thares. She's a nurse uh, practitioner and a physician's assistant. Sheila also helped us to develop the Addiction-Free Pain Management Module 4. Um, that's a guide to managing pain medication in recovery. And it really helps uh, people in recovery uh, prepare and have that insurance policy in case they do come up against some kind of uh, a chronic pain or have an accident. Now these are just some of uh, some of the recovery friendly medications. Um, we're not going to go over them in detail, but we did want you to have the list. You'll notice there's a question mark on the first bullet. Um, this is because uh, we only recommend um, buprenorphine, suboxone, or methadone as a transitional use, not for maintenance. Also, some of these can be used uh, off-label, and if you want more information about them, you can email us. 
On this list, you have neuropathic pain medications, and these are often looked um, overlooked as a better alternative for neuropathic pain uh, inst instead of opiates. Uh, Cymbalta, um, Lyrica, and Cymbalta also has some antidepressant qualities to it as well. And then there's these medications for migraines. Now, if Sharon had been given any of these medica medications when she was having her migraine episodes, she could have been saved a, a lot of pain and suffering. Here's another list, and of course the first one, it's been around a long time, aspirin. Um, some of the anticonvulsants here have also been used uh, off-label for pain. Also, Elevil has been along, around a long time uh, in use for pain management. And then there's the recovery-friendly ointment delivery med medications, patches. Now, these medical procedures are not a fix. Um, Sometimes people do need the, the nerve injections or facet joint injections, nerve blocks, radio frequency. Um, but these are used to help people become more actively uh, available for work such as in physical therapy or hydrotherapy or so that can, they can do more functional restoration work. And these are some of the non-pharmacological approaches, um, which are some of the most important and overlooked treatment interventions. Um, patients really need to see that there are other things available so that they can help better manage their pain. What's listed here and on the next slide are really just a few of hundreds of approaches that have been brought up at many of the APM trainings. What we do is uh, when we're doing the 20-hour uh, addiction free pain management certification school, we have people look at um, what are some of the approaches that they used or that they know about that can uh, help people besides just using medications. So here's a number of them here that actually have been proven and, and are being used um, more widely now uh, for in pain management and, and actually um, medical field as well. Here's another list. Um, unusual ones too. Sweat Lodge, um, Rolfing, Heller, being out in nature, hobbies. One, one woman said, said to us uh, that she really was able to use appropriate uh, avoidance by distraction uh, when she played with her grandchildren, and that was really helpful for her. So when patients receive effective synergistic treatment, this is, this is the outcome. I mean, in putting it all together, our goal is to support patients to more effectively manage their pain. Um, and they can do this using uh, the APM treatment system. And when they really are active participants in their treatment and they have their team and they're um, doing what it is that they need to do in each area of their life, um, they actually begin to uh, decrease their perception of pain and they are no longer suffering with it. Um, they, they see that they're either eliminating their relapse episodes or, or having a reduction in them. Um, definitely their quality of life is getting better and they're able to do more things in their life. They're able to participate more. And they're really taking advantage of these non-pharmacological pain management uh, interventions. They're incorporating them into their life and finding that they're helpful. And they're resolving their psychological disorders. Um, they're looking at their depression and taking care of their uh, sleep hygiene. Um, they're reintegrating with their family and the community, and they're um, some of them even going back to work. Um, and they're 
really taking care of their relapse prevention plan. They're, they, it's in place, and they have people in their life who are going to help them in case they do uh, come up to a relapse. <laughs> and then they have um, continuing care and transition plans. But most important, they have shifted from feeling victimized by their pain and by, by the medical system uh, to feeling empowered and knowing that there are choices that they have um, and that they can make and that they uh, have a lot more uh, influence over the quality of their life and the way their uh, chronic pain um, impacts them. So that's it. Um, we're going to open now for questions and answers. Ellen, thank you very much. Very informative presentation. Uh, we have had some questions that have come in from our audience. Uh, however, we want to remind everyone that you can still use the Q&A widget below the slides to submit a question. Uh, we will get to as many questions as possible in the remaining minutes up to about the top of the hour uh, this afternoon. Um, Ellen, uh, we had a question that came in that regarded uh, a person who might be in long-term recovery has been on one of the medications that might be considered problematic but has had a good track record on the medication without any evidence of uh, using more than prescribed, doctor shopping, anything like that. In an instance like that, even though the medication itself might be one that's on you know, that list of ones to be concerned about with someone with a, an addiction history, would it be better potentially to keep a person who's had a good performance record on that medication or to possibly transfer to another drug? Well, if, it, if it's working, there, there, there's not a real need to, to shift off of it. Um, the, the only thing to be aware of is to have a, a relapse prevent, prevention plan in place that to make sure that they are taking care of the different areas in their life and so that they would be aware of on if you're if we looked at that relapse cycle let's go back to that really quickly um, the relapse cycle um, you know to be aware that if any of these things start to happen that 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 particular medication that they're on could become a problem for them because they might start using it for other reasons than their pain management and if some people have a, a question about it then you can have a, an assessment and evaluation done to look at how they're using it, you know, what, what the pain generator was, and just to have that sense of, of um, security ab about it. But if it's working for them, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a problem. Excellent. Um, Ellen, a question about the addiction-free pain management system just in general. Um, uh, over over what kind of period of time might someone be seen in, in a practice like yours, and, and, and what's the process like in terms of uh, do people, is it a very linear progression as to how people advance, uh, um, you know, in this effort, or, or, or do you have, is it sort of like, like everything else where you have your, you might have fits and starts sometimes? So we often, we, for every, everyone that does come into the, to the practice, there is an evaluation assessment session that I was just talking about and really looks to evaluate uh, all, all the areas, the anxiety, depression, you know, what their pain is, what they've been on, what they've used, what, what, what's worked in the past, what, what hasn't worked in the past, and then um, seeing what, what their level of denial is about their pain condition or the, their um, uh, abuse potential or, or actual addiction is to their medication. Um, and it, 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 of course, like anything in therapy, it depends on the individual person. But the core clinical processes here um, are, can be done in eight sessions, eight to ten sessions. Actually, Steve can do it in eight to 12 sessions. But again, it depends upon that person, um, where they're at in, in their ability to take in the information, how much education do they have about their pain condition, um, what, how available they are to trying different things. Um, but, you know, we do brief strategic um, therapy with people around, uh, around these eight core processes. So um, it, can, it can take longer than that. But at least that much, at least that long, eight to twelve sessions. 
I see. Very good. A uh, question that just came in that I thought was kind of interesting, um, uh, asking what are some of the kinds of non-confrontive things that one might say to someone who's unauthorized use of pain management substances is clearly impairing their own progress into recovery. Uh, are there any thoughts about how that can be addressed in a uh, productive uh, way? Sure. Now, one of the things that that uh, that we do in trainings when we're taking clinicians through the addiction-free pain management uh, system and looking at how to begin talking to people, uh, it's to, it's one of the first things is being being objective. It's it's not I'm not the one who's going to tell you that you're doing something wrong, but we're looking outside at these records. We're looking at this cures report. We're looking at uh, this actual drug test and, and inviting the person to help explain, you know, what might be going on here. So it's not us as an authority figure looking at them and saying, you screwed up or you're in trouble now, but we're a team. I'm a team. I'm, I'm a messenger, you know, but I need some help from you and explaining what it is that we're looking at. You know, there, these are some of the behaviors that, you're look, that we're, we're seeing. This is the concern from your family members. Um, and then, it, of course, it helps to have some experience with, with the denial management and being aware of the, what people use uh, to protect their, from their painful reality, right? This is the painful reality is on some level they know they're screwing up. It's not working well but I don't know what else to do, and I'm terrified that they're going to take away my pain medication and I'm going to be in pain. Not just be in pain, but I am going to suffer with my pain. So you know that there's a host of psychological pain symptoms that people are also suffering, but we need to, to partner with them first to create some rapport and, and be able to put things uh, objectively to the side and get their help in explaining that, and then what do we need to do next? Very good. Um, the, there were a couple questions that came in about uh, non-traditional treatments such as acupuncture, et cetera. Um, any thoughts about how non-traditional approaches, you know, might fit in to an overall look at alternatives to uh, medication? So we don't necessarily believe it's one or the other. I mean, it, some people may need to be on some level of, of medication management. They need to, need, may need to have it. Now, how much and, and what particular medication they're taking uh, can, can be evaluated in the scheme of things, but it's a, a, just one piece. So they're taking care of their medication management and looking at what else could be done, what could be more effective, what could be uh, less risky. Um, then we really need to look at what are the psychological symptoms of, of their pain, what's, what's showing up for them. We have a, an exercise that um, we have uh, patients do that can really help determine, help, help a clinician see how many of the pain symptoms do they have, how many of their symptoms uh, pain-related are physical and how many are psychological. And just because a pain symptom is psychological doesn't mean that it's in their head or that it's not a pain that they feel. Um, the, the, the pain symptoms are actually the amplification that then affect how they physically feel something. So when people get educated about that side, that's when they can see, oh, I have a lot more control here. And it's actually good news when we can get them beyond thinking that it's all in my head. And then the, the, the other piece is non-pharmacological as a part of it. Um, but if, if someone has a desire and they want to get off all medication, then it's just something that they have to work with their, with their providers about. Now, I'll share with you that Steve had a, a, a construction accident when uh, he uh, was, in, uh, was an electrician, and he was also in early recovery. And he had to go to five surgeons to find one who would help him without surgery and without any um, addictive medications. And they said, you know, if you do all these other things, uh, the non-pharmacological, if you do all of this stuff, 
nine, ten years down the line, you're going to be physically in the same place that someone who had an operation and took medication would be in. And it turned out to be true. Fascinating. That's really a good good account and certainly probably confirms a lot of what you're doing in, in your work. Um, Ellen, uh, thank you very much again. It looks like we've hit about the top of the hour, so it looks like that will be all the time we have for questions. But uh, I will pass along now to the audience some final instructions regarding CE credit. Please note that the CE certificate process has changed, so again, pay attention to the following. CE Learning Systems has approved today's program for one continuing education credit. To receive your certificate of completion, you must click the green evaluation form widget, complete the evaluation form, and click Submit. You will receive your certificate of completion via email in the next two business days. For those watching in a group, as a reminder, please download the group submission um, uh, guide and the evaluation form located in the resources area and follow the instructions provided. If you have any questions, please click the purple Contact CE Help Desk widget at the bottom of the screen. I also want to invite you to please join us on July 10th, Wednesday, July 10th, 2013 at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for another Foundations Recovery Network webinar sponsored by ALIR, titled An Intervention Blueprint for Patients with Advanced Psychiatric Conditions, presented by Heather R. Hayes. A link will appear on your screen in a moment for you to register for this program. You can also register for the event by clicking the purple Register for the Next Foundations webinar widget at the bottom right of the screen. I want to once again thank Ellen Grinstead for an excellent presentation. I also would like to thank our sponsor, Alir, for making today's Foundations Recovery Network program possible. Finally, thank you to you and our audience for participating today. We hope you'll join us in the future for another Addiction Professional webinar. This concludes today's presentation.